Welcome to the latest installment of the AST AJT Journal Club series. Today's Journal Club on impaired humoral immunity to the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine in kidney transplant recipients and dialysis patients is hosted by the AST Community of Transplant Scientists. Our speaker today is Dr. Eva Stretzenmeier from the Charity University of Medicine in Berlin, Germany. Our moderators today are Dr. Amandeep Bajwa from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and Dr. Anoma Nalor from the University of Alabama Birmingham Medicine. Before we begin the main presentation, we do have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's session. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This journal club is being recorded and the archive will be available on the MyAST website within two to three business days after the session. Please note that your lines have all been muted so that only the presenters can be heard clearly for the archive recording. If you have any questions for our panelists during the journal club, we encourage you to participate by using the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar panel. Questions submitted via chat may be missed during the presentation. If there are questions that we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the journal club. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's journal club, you will see a link to the short evaluation survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Nalor, to begin today's presentation. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, really delighted to have Dr. Schrezenmeyer speak to us about her exciting paper, uh, Impaired Humoral Immunity to SARS-CoV-2 Vaccine in Kidney Transplant Recipients and Dialysis Patients. Uh, I think the paper represents uh, the unity of an extremely well-characterized clinical cohort and cutting edge mechanistic science. So um, great to turn it over to Dr. Schrezenmeyer and grateful also to the AST and the Community of Transplant Scientists. Hey, um, dear audience, thank you for the nice uh, introduction, Dr. Nenlor, and thank you to the AST to have the opportunity to present our data. So as in yeah, a lot of late uh, sessions, I'm talking about the impaired vaccine response in our kidney transplant recipients and in dialysis patients. So, during the start of the pandemic and also yeah, in the beginning of the years, we already have learned that uh, the vaccine response in dialysis dependent CKD patients and in kidney transplant recipients is decreased. It is only slightly reduced in the dialysis patients. They show a lower zero conversion rate and lower antibody titers, but they in general have a good serological response, which goes up to 90% in most cohorts. And they have a comparable T cell response as in the healthy individuals. What we also found out in the beginning of the year is that the really vulnerable populations are the kidney transplant recipients. They only show a vaccine response after two doses of the vaccine of up to 40% in uh, the cohort of Boyaski et al. And also already data have been published after a third vaccination where the serological vaccine response goes up to 60%. They show a decreased T cell response and also the German Transplant Society and other societies around the world suggest a third booster vaccination in these immunocompromised patients. So what we did in our study is that we vaccinated or in the usual yeah, schedule of the vaccines in Germany, 40 kidney transplant recipients have been uh, vaccinated with the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine 21 to 20 days uh, apart. We also uh, had as a yeah, more or less control group, 25 healthcare workers and elderly patients. We collected the um, samples in January. So these were the only um, um, yeah, healthy volunteers that were eligible for vaccination at this early time point. And we also collected as a control group um, dialysis patients here, 44, with the same vaccine schedule. 
We then check their blood for antibody levels and antigen specific B cells at the day seven after the second vaccination. Because we know from other vaccine studies, and uh, for example, tetanus or yellow fever, that this is the day where you expect peripheral plasma cytosis. And then we did a later follow-up for only a serological response three weeks after the vaccine. So what we saw in our cohort is that we saw a diminished antibody response in the S1 um, IgG in the dialysis patients and that we didn't see any responders seven days after the boost, neither in IgA nor in the IgG. The, we also did a neutralization test by surrogate uh, assay in ELISA where uh, the IgGs compete for the ACE receptor. And we also found this diminished neutralization capacity in dialysis patients and kidney transplant uh, recipients. And what we have to say and what I want to add in this slide is that our cohort um, cons uh, has a very very uniform regimen of immunosuppressions. All our patients were on triple immunosuppression and uh, had uh, mycophenolate uh, in their medication. So we also checked then only sero the serological response um, after three weeks after the boost, and we saw a slight increase in the total IgG, IgA, and the neutralization capacity in the dialysis patients, but we could not observe this uh, in the kidney transplant recipients, where we still only had uh, one weak responder. So, of course, I'm from a B-cell group focusing, uh, yes, on, uh, on peripheral uh, B-cells. We then uh, characterized the patient's B-cells. We irrigated for CD19 positive B-cells. We separated them in uh, plasma blasts and non-plasma blasts and gated for 27 IgD to separate uh, naive pre-switch, post-switch, and double negative B-cells. Here we found that already in the uh, beginning, the um, kidney transplant recipients, of course, had diminished total B cell numbers in uh, the periphery. The distributions of the subset was also different in uh, terms of the naive B cells and the kidney transplant recipients had fewer pre-switched um, memory B cells. Otherwise, the subset distributions uh, was unaffected. So when we then looked at the isotypes of uh, our B cells. Here's the gating. We gated uh, for IgG, IgA, and non IgG, IgA uh, B cells, which we defined as uh, IgM B cells. We found that among the plasma blasts in healthy controls, all our Ig or um, great majority are IgG positive, while uh, in the kidney transplant recipients, we lack this IgG positive uh, B cells. So we then in a further step looked for antigen specific B cells. And we did this uh, with a technique of a double labeling uh, of the RBD specific B cells. We labeled the RBD protein, uh, which uh, yeah, is in the vaccine and is the receptor binding domain of the S1 protein. Um, and we labeled this with Alexa Fluor 488 and Alexa Fluor 647. And we considered the double positive uh, cells as antigen specific B cells. Here is uh, one example, and we performed the block. So we added uh, excessive uh, RBD protein um, and um, then did the usual staining and couldn't detect the cells anymore when the receptor uh, was blocked. 
We also confirmed that these cells are antigen specific by uh, single cell RNA sequencing and BCR sequencing and found previously described BCR sequences enriched among um, our detected and sorted uh, B cells. What we found is uh, that the percentage of RBD specific B cells in the periphery increased in all in healthy controls in dialysis patients and also in the kidney transplant uh, recipients. But this, of course, but the absolute number um, in, was decreased in dialysis patients and in the kidney transplant recipients. So they do have fewer B cells in the periphery and they're. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, less likely to be antigen specific. When we then get it for the antigen specific, this RBD positive B cells, um, what are they? Which cells are they? And then we found that in healthy controls, a high proportion, about 20%, are in the plasma blast compartment as we classically expect this to be blown out of the bone marrow after a boost and uh, or uh, and be circulating uh, plasma blast while in the kidney transplant recipients they were not able um, to produce any antigen specific uh, plasma blast in the dialysis patients we found some of these uh, cells we then um, did um, clustering analysis of these patients just to depict again what are these uh, cells and how are they missing uh, in the kidney transplant recipients and here you see 27 and uh, CD38 and uh, IgG and in the kidney transplant recipients you, you see there are less IgG there are less CD38 which is a marker for plasma cells and there are less CD27 and they're more uh, IgM, so non-IgA, non-IgG in the kidney transplant recipients compared to uh, the healthy controls. Then we looked what of our whole panel correlates uh, with the serological response uh, in the total cohort. And then I think what was we had everything from a very good response in our young healthy controls to a very bad response uh, in our kidney transplant recipients. But we also had some patients that were in the middle between good and bad, somehow responding with not so high titers. And these were our dialysis patients. And we found that the serological um, uh, response correlated on the one side just with the absolute plasma blast in the periphery on that day seven after vaccination and with the RBD specific uh, antigen specific plasma blast. So there we found a nice correlations in this uh, small cohort. And then we split this up again just for visualization in uh, the response responders and the non-responders. And here we did this by the nucleocapsid. And uh, yeah, just to distinguish the relative and absolute numbers in peripheral RBD specific plasma blasts um, here in the upper panel, the relative and down the, uh, the uh, absolute numbers. And we see that this is a good yeah, measure to distinguish responders from non-responders at a very early time point. We also picked four patients where at a time point where we didn't know um, who will respond and will not respond and uh, did single cell RNA sequencing. And uh, we did this uh, panel and we uh, sorted activate T cells to really detect small population and memory B cells and the plasma blast. And we were so lucky to catch the one uh, responder uh, we had. And we see that in this uh, patient, we see an increase also in this, uh, in, uh, this single cell data in plasma blast and in this cluster five and uh, cluster five are activated granzyme positive uh, T cells. 
so of course this is the this is the first uh, paper and that's yeah basically all of the information uh, in there but of course as i already mentioned in my introduction we're going uh, further and uh, everyone wants to know what's uh, after the boost vaccination this was able to really increase uh, their vaccine response and um, what happens after another boost? Maybe they just need one other uh, shot our patients. Uh, so we were so uh, lucky that of our, um, of our um, cohort of these 40 patients, uh, 25 of them we could follow up and they got a boost, which was uh, back then um, off label, but um, uh, some of the um, general physicians said, okay, we see they're not protected. We're seeing severe infections. Also in our cohort, we had one patient uh, with a severe infection going to the ICU and they vaccinated um, 25 of the patients. And in um, Germany, we had the option uh, to uh, pick either the BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine or the a vaccine from AstraZeneca, which is a vector vaccine. And there were also the yeah, first data um, out that in healthy control, this heterologous boost raises a very strong um, immune response and in the healthy controls. And so the hypothesis, of course, was that maybe the heterologous boost is even better in our immunocompromised patients to induce a vaccine response. And so we did basically the same check for antigen specific B cells seven days after boost and did a follow up for serological response three weeks after uh, the vaccine. So here's uh, the results of these 14 versus 11 uh, patients. So uh, again, in this cohort, the immunosuppression was very uniform. And uh, we had one patient, I already told you, that got infected. Um, and so we missed the day 21 follow-up, but followed her until day seven after boost, where she didn't have a response. And we had one patient who was not uh, on MMF uh, at that time point. The others all um, um, were on MMF. Uh, treatment. So uh, again, very uniform. We had 11 with the booster uh, with BioNTech and 14 with the booster uh, with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And we put them here all together. The, the response was not that uh, overwhelming again. Um, and um, then they did show a um, so more patients, uh, about a third of the patients, nine of uh, this 27, showed a vaccine response, uh, but it was not as good as uh, we wished for it. Um, they were all antibody negative uh, before that. And there was not a big difference in the zero response between the two uh, vaccines. So we... Uh, we then checked also for antigen specific uh, B cells and also here comparing second and third vaccine in the total population, there was no uh, difference in peripheral antigen specific B cells. But if you uh, check for the responders versus the non-responders, the responders showed significantly higher of total RBD specific um, peripheral B cells seven days after the vaccine. So again, it's a useful tool to distinguish very early if they're going to uh, respond or not. In this paper, we also uh, did some uh, T cell data. And also here, uh, we would have expected a bigger difference but um, the main difference was again here between the responders and the non-responders and not between the two different uh, vaccine, uh, vaccines. So it's, um, they do, do distinguish, but not between uh, so much between second and third. And um, so here you could uh, can see the total spike specific uh, T cells uh, and here the CD4 for uh, and IL-2 producing uh, cells, which showed the biggest uh, difference. So 
I'd like to summarize that we saw a markedly reduced serological and cellular response after the vaccination with uh, the BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine, that the antigen-specific B cell response is characterized by a decrease in peripheral antigen-specific plasma blasts, and that a third vaccination only leads to a certain uh, zero conversion in one third, and uh, that the antigen specific T cell response only changes slightly, as well as the antigen specific B cell response. So, of course, many people have been involved in uh, these two uh, projects, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank them all for their contributions. Um, and I'm happy to uh, hear your questions. Okay, that was really um, excellent and, 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 a, and a lot of data. Um, I, I think we have a, a broad group of people in the, in the audience. I, I wanted to ask you a, a couple of questions um, related to your clinical cohort. Um, could you describe how many years out from transplant that you were studying? Um, and I know you described a little bit about the immunosuppression just so that we get a, we get a sense of that for the audience. Yeah, so a lot of them were after, um, so were in, had stable graft function and were uh, between five and 10 years after uh, transplantation. So we didn't have any freshly transplanted uh, patients. We found now in bigger data analysis from the bigger cohort that, of course, length after transplantation uh, is one um, yeah, risk factor for, uh, so the shorter you transplant, the, the higher the risk you don't respond to that. Uh, vaccine, but our, our cohort was, yeah, more of the long-term transplanted patients. And, and just to review the immunosuppression that your patients received uniformly, what was the regimen? The regimen was a steroid CNI, so low dose uh, CNI with tuck levels uh, between four and eight. Um, and microphenolate, different formulations, uh, of course. Um, but, so, and we had one patient of MMF, but um, the others were all on MMF. So we chatted about this earlier, but would you like to comment on um, the differences in the percentage of seroconversion in your, your cohort versus what was published by uh, Brian Boyarski and, and some other individuals um, in, in the United States? Yes, I think so. There's different, uh, different factors contributing to this uh, big difference. I think the first is that uh, the majority of this cohort uh, used the Moderna uh, vaccine, and this contains four times the dose of the BioNTech-Pfizer uh, vaccine. So we now went over to vaccinating our kidney transplant recipients with uh, the Moderna vaccine just to increase the dose of uh, vaccine. This is, I think, one major difference. But still, they had better response rate also in their sub cohort uh, with a BioNTech Pfizer vaccine. And this is, of course, that they had uh, not only kidney transplant recipients, but uh, they um, also had other organ, maybe in liver, they had some liver transplant recipients, and uh, they were on lower immunosuppressions. Uh, and especially, they were more likely on a double immunosuppression. Uh, immunosuppression and not on a triple therapy. So these are all factors contributing that we saw this big uh, difference. In our total cohort, if we look our, at whole center, we now overview about also 400 patients. We um, also don't see this very, uh, this effect that we don't have any responders, so we do, but um, in the, this first cohort uh, from January, uh, we recruited them uh, from outside of Berlin, from the periphery, uh, where they, the vaccine was earlier uh, responsible. And these patients were on a very classical kedigo guided triple immunosuppression and without any reduction, which is usually not our center policy. So we do reduce steroids earlier. 
do you what do you see as the clinical future forward to um, help get better vaccine responses in these patients? And so what we now do is a reduction of MMS in stable transparent recipients. We do this under strict clinical uh, control of uh, patients have to come four weeks after. So we pause the MMF, then do the vaccination. And then uh, we only do this in um, patients without donor specific antibodies. And uh, so we select the patients and the other, we only do a, a reduction, which is a very interesting cohort, of course, is the bilatacept uh, treated uh, patients because we see very bad responses in these patients and don't have an idea yet what to do with them. They're just very properly immunosuppressed at the basic receptors for uh, vaccine and yeah, response. Um, so this is what we're doing now. We see that it's safe. We didn't see uh, adverse event there. And it's all, always so concerning the patients. Of course, they're afraid to change. They've been on the same immunosuppressants for years. Uh, and what we um, tell them is it's the same we would do in pregnancy. And then we pause the immunosuppression for years or for a year uh, during pregnancy and conception. Um, and this has been shown earlier that this can be done in a selected group of uh, patients. And I think the other thing is that there is an, um, in the latest edition of transplantation, it's out that even after two vaccines, they have a decrease in mortality after the vaccination. So even if we don't see perfect antibody titers, it seem, there seems to be something. So in Germany, we're having the fourth wave and a lot of infections at the moment, very poorly controlled here. Um, and we still hope that after at least the boost and three doses, they have some kind of protection, even if we don't measure it in the antibodies. We have a, a few questions in the chat. Um, I think one is relevant to the topic at hand. Um, so there is a question about um, bridging with high dose IVIG when you reduce um, or eliminate cell sept. It sounds like you're reducing and not eliminating cell sept. Um, some we do reduce and some we eliminate. If, okay. we're, if the patients are like compliant enough to be safe with their uh, CNI dosage and the prednisone, then we also uh, do reduce. Um, I, took, I haven't thought of the option to cover with IVIG, so um, we don't do this as uh, at our center and uh, yeah, maybe a good idea for the uh, like, we don't do it in patients that are less than one year after a, a transplant or had DSA or rejection episodes, maybe in these patients when we still want them to respond. So I think the other question is going back to the clinical characterization of your cohort. Um, are, are, do you have data about um, prior um, COVID prior to vaccination in, in, your, in your cohort or prior exposure to other endemic coronaviruses? Uh, yeah, other coronaviruses, we don't have this, but we checked for a nucleocapsid uh, and this was uh, negative in all the patients and we had one or two positives, we excluded uh, them and yeah. So we checked, of course, and now it's known that also the nucleocapsid patient uh, antigen in corona infected uh, patients is not as um, as reliable as it is in healthy individual because it's also likely that they don't show an antibody response even after infection but in, uh, they didn't have like clinical signs um, or they haven't been hospitalized at least with corona if they had um, asymptomatic infection we don't know that but uh, they didn't have nucleocapsid antibodies and they, they never reported um, PCR positivity before. So we have, I think. So a while the questions are coming in, uh, may I ask, um, did you uh, observe any sort of sex differences in these patients in response to the vaccines? 
No, we also didn't see this in the bigger cohort. Sex uh, was not um, a contributing factor. So of course in our cohort, it's too small with uh, 40 uh, patients and they, uh, um, we had some more males, I think as the typical uh, CKD patients, but say slightly more males, but we didn't observe any uh, sex uh, difference in the multivirgal analysis, we then kicked this out also out uh, for the not to have another other, uh, variable or also in the correlation matrix, we didn't find something for sex. But also in the, our bigger cohorts, um, we also thought so because maybe, um, um, yeah, maybe just the weight and the dose uh, is, is different and but we didn't find any differences. Okay, so um, another question is, um, are the non-responders um, that you observe, is it due to lymphopenia? Uh, no, not uh, only. No, it's, uh, they are leukopenic, more leukopenic than the, um, of course, than the healthy controls, but comparable to the, um, uh, to the, dialysis patients, but also we didn't find this as a variable associated with a response. Of course, in our like described cohorts, it's hard to say because we only have one responder. So any, it's just statistically different, uh, dif uh, difficult uh, to say what among the transplant recipients we could just compare it in the total cohort because then we had something like 120 uh, patients, but then there were of course uh, mixed. I, we thought, okay, this might be a good approach for the antigen specific uh, B cells. But uh, of course, for all other things, it's very difficult in this, uh, in this non-responder cohort, it's uh, more yeah, to determine mechanistically what is their impairment. And we also just, we did another cohort uh, of a rituximab uh, treated uh, patients uh, with, uh, um, and also checked for the antigen specific PCS. And also we, again, we found there that this induction of peripheral plasma cytosis, which also can be uh, achieved under even rituximab treatment is like the leading point uh, for a vaccine response. And this was just the first paper where we could show uh, this also in this immunosuppressed patients. But of course, not for all answers, this cohort is perfect because of course you would always wish at least 10 or 20% uh, responders versus non-responders to com better compare what are their characteristics. And we couldn't do this. Um, there are two questions that came out that I, I'd like to try to put together. Um, the first is, what is the time frame for the pause of CELSEPT that your center is doing? And then the second is, have you just observed a difference in seroresponsiveness after um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccination now that your center is employing reduction in uh, cell set. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, we do it for five weeks in general. So we start one week bef uh, before vaccination because, as you know, we um, it takes some time until the effect vanishes. And uh, so we give them one week, then we do the vaccination. And then we do four weeks uh, of pause and then um, uh, we do a zero, um, so we uh, assess a serological uh, response and then they start again. And yes, we see a difference. So I would say my just from clinics or from outpatient clinics, my uh, feeling is that the responder rate is now uh, in these like non-responsive, we only do this in non-responsive uh, patients after three doses uh, is, something like seven, 60, 70 percent at least with and then good titrus or where they also have neutralization. We also had then a lot of patients after three vaccines with this like intermediate low titrus like 0.8 to 1 in the in the um, in the Roche ELISA which then also was negative um, four weeks later or so but there we see stable as quite stable and good response. 
um, let's see. Um, so one of the questions is, are you attempting to combine these studies with clinical effectiveness data to develop insights about correlates of protection? Um, yes, but I think we, um, so we have a lot of more data from our uh, whole center. We have about a thousand patients where, where we uh, regularly did um, determination of antibody levels and guess we're going to gather up all this data but we do it more of course this deep uh, phenotyping with B and T cells can could only be done in a small uh, cohort and it's more uh, yeah for the explanations why it does not uh, work but I think we now at least have an idea what the um, basic immunologic uh, problem um, and we will just sum up the clinical data from the large cohort will, which will then uh, consist of uh, more patients and we th then we'll also have this really interesting comparison if it's more effective uh, in bigger cohorts because 11 versus 14 is not a good number to assess uh, effectiveness for the homologous versus heterologous boost. And now that we have these high numbers, I think, yes, we will also see who gets infected and who not. So unfortunately, but we do see infections now. So, so you have some opportunities with your unfortunate fourth wave to, to yeah. see what may possibly correlate with protection. Yes. Um, I, I think there's another question um, that goes back to um, Dr. Boyarski's um, publication. Um, I think that this group has gone on to look at zero responsiveness um, 90 days after SARS-CoV-2 vaccination, which I think is two months after what you, you have reported. And um, they are documenting um, uh, responses that increase from approximately 50% um, at two to four weeks after second dose to 70% at that three month um, time point. How do you explain these findings in the context of your data? Mm. Yeah, I already thought of uh, this question and I, I'm honest, I cannot really uh, explain it. Um, so what, so is, I think the big surprise already or in the, if you compare the healthy controls with the kidney transplant recipients or the dialysis patients, that the immune response is so delayed. So what does this delay where we know that the mRNA vaccines are just stable for some hours and get expressed, but where does the antigen go? What happens to it? Does it persist somewhere or uh, that this maturation takes place? place later in compared to so in a healthy individual basically there is no also in the like the first data from uh from uh Uwe Zahin from biontech in published in nature they you don't see in the healthy controls you don't see a big difference between a seven and even three weeks after the T cell response doesn't increase, the B cell response and the antibodies do not increase. But in the KTR, we also saw this, that you don't have to measure before three weeks because it takes that time for them to develop the immune response. And still I'm puzzling, uh, where do they keep their antigens? Where are their cells? Why do they need longer? I have no idea. Yeah, no, I, I think I think the question and, and your response raised some very important points about unknowns about the germinal center response to vaccine antigen in vulnerable patients like solid organ transplant recipients. Um, and, and I want to go back and ask you a question about your data. Um, you, you are reporting a correlation between plasma blasts and the RBD specific B cells that you found in kidney transplant patients. What does that data suggest to you about the ontogeny of these RBD specific B cells? I mean, how are, are they being generated in germinal centers? What, what, are, you, what, are, your, what are your thoughts there? So my thoughts are, and also maybe with this, uh, with this delayed immune response, and this is what we know, we also check for six CR, CR5, is that they're from an extra follicular uh, immune response and that they don't go straight to the bone marrow and persist uh, there, uh, but it 
yeah, it's more maybe in the lymph node, in the spleen, wherever, but not uh, not the classical germinal center uh, response and more like we see plasma cytosis or for autoantigen like in lupus or in other autoimmune diseases where we see flares of just unspecific peripheral short living autoantibody producing uh, plasma cells that then maybe don't find their spot and just vanish again after some kind of immune flare and then their extra germinal center. Um, so another question is that in patients in whom you hold MMF prior to and post um, uh, COVID-2 vaccination, do you see decline in antibody titers once you resume MMF? Um, I don't have a big, let me think, but no, I don't think we see it. I only have an overview, maybe about 30 patients or so. Um, but as far as I'm aware of, we don't see a decline after we start MMF again. All right, thank you. Um, and then um, one of the last questions is, um, let me, sorry, I lost track. Um, It says, um, I'll just read it. Um, I believe you said that, that that pause MFF in selected patients. Is this just based on who doesn't respond to two to three vac vaccine doses and lack of DSA? Or are there other criteria to be used to judge that MFF can be safely paused? Um, yeah, so I think non-DSA and also no rejection episodes in the, um, in the past, of course, that they if someone had an early to some mediated rejection, we wouldn't pause it in this person too. And our cutoff is two at our center that we say, we don't do this one, like until one year after transplantation. And um, the other thing is that's important, especially for this is that they um, are compliant patients that you can reach out and we tell them again in this time, it's even more important that you really take the other two drugs and don't uh, skip a pill of your Advagraf or whatever. Um, and these are other factors. Um, yeah, and also, of course, some patients don't want it. I would say like every fourth or fifth patient just doesn't want to change uh, the immunosuppressive regimen because they've been taking it for years. Of course, we then don't like force them to or um, advise it too much because, of course, this, um, yeah, they love their kidneys so much <laughs> that, that they want don't, don't want to lose. Um, there's a, a question in the chat: Would delaying the second dose from three weeks to ninety days be a better approach, or be, be give a better response? Yes, I think so. That, that so. This is my personal op opinion that this uh, would be, and I think we already analyzed some of our data, and we saw that the hydro hydrologous uh, boost, so two doses, one um, AstraZeneca, and then the BioNTech boost, gives a better race to uh, antibodies. And I don't know if this is just a confounder because the spacing was bigger. All these that got first. AstraZeneca and then uh, BioNTech got at least three months, uh, 90 days between the two vaccines. And uh, if we correct, like for the the uh, vaccine spacing, this is an independent variable for a response. So yes, this might make sense. And in the beginning, of course, we've all been, okay, we need to break this, we need to vaccinate, vaccinate, and then uh, took very, uh, yeah, very short, uh, times between the vaccinations, which might not have uh, been the smartest choice. Yeah. To go back to your data just for one second from the from the Jason paper, are you um, able to um, figure out after the boost if in kidney transplant patients if preformed um, naive or IgM specific RBD specific B cells are being recalled? No, technically we cannot distinguish if they're 
if they're recalled or not. We just you don't have a yeah. sense of the priming of ability of those prior vaccines. That they did some priming, of course, they have after, they, of course, so most of uh, the patients do, we, in them, we do see some antigen specific T cells. So we know that they have a T cell response. And I would say what we indicate as a factor that they, this third vaccination has an effect is that they produce more IL 2. And then this production of more IL 2, which is very and more IL 4 as general B cell stimulants for also extra follicular B cell response is, yeah the hypothesis that it then might work that we uh, increase T cell response over it, but we cannot technically say from where they are recalled and if the responders they didn't uh, they didn't went different in baseline characteristics of the uh, RBD specific B cells um, so they didn't have different in different compartment they went more naive they went more IgM or they went more like IgG that we know they have been already there. They have just been basically non-detectable at this pre-vaccination time point at, in all of them. All right, um, so one of the last questions is, um, other than the dose differences that you already pointed out, do you consider Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna homologs or heterologs? So, the, like the German, um, the Robert Koch Institute, they say it's um, homologous. So even if they got to switch in Moderna or, yeah, they on, the only heterologous is vector plus mRNA. So it doesn't matter which, they say, it doesn't matter which vector, so Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca, and it doesn't matter which uh, mRNA. So, but two times vector or two times is always, uh, homologous and vector plus mRNA or other way around as the heterologous. So this is, I'm not aware of uh, international like consensus on that, but uh, I think this is quite the consensus that this is homologous versus heterologous. So along those lines, um, do you have an explanation why heterologous may be producing better responses? Okay, there. I think there. Um, of course, one which I said. I think there. There is a big confounder with the spacing of the vaccines. We just decided that we spaced them uh, longer from the beginning on. AstraZeneca has been um, uh, recommended uh, for uh, for spacing of um, ninety days. So um, this is the one thing, and the other is that we know also in. Um, kidney transplant recipients from an uh, work from Marina Sester uh, in Saarbrücken that uh, they induce a stronger T cell response. So if you have, as we see in the in our responders versus non-responders in the Jason paper, that you have a stronger T cell response in the beginning, then you're more likely to get enough B cell uh, help to get plasma blasts in the periphery. So this is the other, that this is just more potent in increasing uh, T-cell response. Um, Ava, there is a, a really interesting question. We've been chatting a lot about the adaptive immune response, right? Um, but there is a question about, are, do you have thoughts about ineffective innate immunologic responses, such as TLR7, as a sensor to the RNA vaccine and, and how that might compromise responses? That's a very good point. Actually, we didn't check for that, but um, uh, thanks for that tip. Might be uh, might be worth uh, checking to see, but actually I never checked with the CPG stimulation or whatever in these patients how their um, yeah TLR signaling uh, is. I did this a lot in lupus, but uh, not in uh, transplant recipients so far. But <laughs> worthwhile trying. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, along um, to summarize um, the last question, maybe a statement is that um, as your paper summarized that there's an urgent need to improve vaccination protocols in patients after kidney transplantations, the question is, what are the specific potential improvements that emerge based on your data? So I think the improvement 
is um, based on our data that, that we need to give them the possibility to raise a plasma blast uh, response. This is reduction in immunosuppression and maybe even yeah, higher dosage and more uh, spacing and that we in some way are able or to predict this very early who's a responder and uh, who will not uh, respond. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like we don't have any more questions. Uh, Anoma, do you have any other questions? Well, I mean, I, I think I would just ask Eva to give us a little insight into what her future directions might be um, as, she can, as she can share um, before we're considering wrapping up. Uh, yes, yeah, so of course, the uh, future uh, is to look at this uh, fourth time uh, vaccines. Uh, and look at their antigen specific B and T cell response because we see the like a really good zero conversion rate. Uh, what is different uh, in them, and then wrap up our all our yeah big clinical uh, cohort data, and also to compare it uh, with other immunosuppressive uh, regimens now where we have more data. So what is the um, and look at some like, like special kidney transplant recipients like the Bilatacept uh, treated patients or the mTOR uh, patients where you need big numbers to really see what they're doing because you just catch one or two. So you need at least one or two centers uh, um, bringing together all their patients. And of course, we want to see what we can offer to these patients. Thank you so much, um, Eva, and, 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 and to everyone who participated. I, I think, and Brian can correct me if I'm wrong, we held 54 to 55 people um, in attendance. So I, I think everybody was extremely interested in your, in your data, your group's data. Um, so, so thank you so much. Thank you for the nice discussion and moderation. Great session. Thank you. Thank you. AST would like to thank our panelists, Drs. Schretzmeyer, Bajwa, and Nolor, and all of our attendees for today's great presentation and discussion. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey after the webinar and visit myaast.org slash journal club to view our video archives and register for upcoming journal clubs. To learn more about the AST's community of transplant scientists, please visit myaast.org slash COPS or connect directly to this community of transplant scientists hub. Thank you again for today's great session.